Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Men's Monday Night Bible Study. This is another Craig Campbell Appreciation Night. As he is off being a dad and a coach, I'll try to cover for him as best as I can. Thankfully, he has left details and instructions, and I think we're recording so that he can give me a grade <laughs> on my fill-in. All right, well, in Craig's honor, we should review the entire book of Corinthians in uh, 30 minutes or less. Uh, what do you guys remember? Corinthians, who's the author? Paul. Paul, and who's he, uh, who's he writing to? <laughs> See, we're doing, good. we're doing good, Craig. Everybody remembers. We're rolling, man. We're rolling. Paul to the Corinthians. What's the major uh, trouble he's addressing at this point? So far? Uh, yeah, carnal behavior. Carnal behavior. So specifically... Is this when he's in jail or no? No, I don't think he's in jail. Um, but I'm asking about the Corinthians, their trouble. Uh, remember there was divisions among them? They were kind of going back and forth. But I think we go back... Following all different people. I follow you. Yeah. I follow yeah. Paul. I follow Paulus. <laughs> yeah, verse 4. Hey, wait, are we following Paul? Christ? Paulus, <laughs> yeah. And there was one other mention where there was there was like four names. And I'm scanning as fast as I can, but I can't find that. But yeah, that's what they were talking about. Um, so last week, I think we covered. Uh, the, the last several verses in chapter 3. Um, a couple weeks ago we talked about Master Builder Pete. Um, then we got to works being tested and if they're going to get a reward in heaven. Talked about believers being God's temple. We talked about the danger of, of false teachers in the church and the judgment that they would come under from God. Talked about wisdom, earthly wisdom versus heavenly wisdom, and and how we should look for the latter. Um, not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Amen. Let no one boast in men, verse 24. And then he kind of 21. I'm sorry, 21. Kind of talked about to the Christian, all things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. So he goes. he's going back to that, that problem of, of, of them gravitating towards a certain personality, a certain preacher, a certain minister, and saying, I'm on his team, you know, and we, we're on the blue team, you know, and the blue team, we got all the good skateboards. And you guys on the red team, you know, you don't got square root of squat all. Um, but Paul is trying to take them from, from those little petty waste of time attitudes and, and thoughts, like Pete said, carnality, worldliness, and raise them up to a bigger spiritual view to say, man, you are Christ. First 20 thing, Christ is God, so really you're kind of limiting yourself by wanting to just be associated with this one certain group or faction or minister. Okay, you guys remember anything else that we talked about or you want to mention or stir a question from last week that you didn't ask? That brings us to chapter 4, verse 1. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart, then each one of you, each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us 
not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Father, thanks for your holy, inspired word. We pray that you would cause it to come alive in our hearts and minds tonight, that you would encourage us in the most holy faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Back to verse 1. Paul speaking to the Corinthians and specifically about ministers of the gospel. He's mentioned in the latter chapter, Paul, Apollo, Cephas. This is how one should regard us. This is how one, general term for a man, but specifically a believing person. This is how a believer, because remember back, what was it in chapter 2, we talked about how spiritual things are, are foolishness to the natural person. In verse 14, he does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. Chapter 2, verse 14. So it makes sense that He's talking to the believers in the church, saying this is how one, this is how one of you, this is how the brothers should regard us, us being Paul as an elder and his fellow elders, Apollos, Cephas, the preachers, the ministers. This is how y'all should look at us or think about us. And it's going to be a contrast, right? Because they are thinking about them in an unhealthy way fleshly, braggadocious, factious way in that, hey, hey, I'm with Apollos, the cool guys. We all got the name brand tennis shoes or whatever. And so he's going to say, rather than what you're doing, this is how you th should think of us. As servants of Christ. The Greek word I can't pronounce, but I know that it means an under rower the lowest level of galley slave in the bottom of the ship where, the, where none of them have names. Maybe they have numbers or brands on them, but they don't have any freedoms and they don't get treated well and they just have one job. It's not complex. It's not complicated. It's just row to the beat of the drum. You're, you're just the, the, the propulsion. Uh, you, you're the machine. You know, we'll, we'll try to give you enough water and and maybe a little food so that you can keep rowing but that's all we need you for it's all we want you to do you don't get to see the light of day you're just an under rower a galley slave and that's the Greek word that he uses us ministers and those guys you're mentioning and associating yourself with we're galley slaves like you're attaching yourself to someone that is a nobody that it's not famous, that nobody knows, that's all shackled up, you can't do anything for you, can't help you, can't get you where you want to go. This is how you should view us, not as, as uh, heroes or celebrities, but as under rowers, servants, galley slaves of Christ. It's just the picture of I'm the, I'm the water boy on the team. I have the most menial job, the least responsibility. All I get to do is carry the water out to the to the goat. Uh, that's for you. <laughs> um, you know that joke, Nicky, the goat the reference, greatest of all time. Uh, Tom Brady. Tom Brady, quarterback, a lot of Super Bowls, yada yada yada, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Anyway, Paul saying you should view us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So do they, is he saying that to kind of humble the people, to say you're really nothing? You're just, you're the lowest rung, so. He's not saying that about them, he's saying that about himself <clears throat> and his fellow ministers, yeah. his fellow elders, his fellow apostles. He, he's, he's pointing out how ludicrous it is that, like it would make sense, like I know Tom Brady, I have his jersey, he signed it, I'm over to his house every week for Cool Ranch Doritos. Um, 
you know, we're basically best friends. I'm, I'm in his club. That, you know, that would make sense in so, at some level, humanly speaking. But to say, hey, man, yeah, I was down with the under rowers today. What, they let them out of their shackles? Yeah, they were out for like 30 minutes. They got to use the bathroom. I mean, they didn't get in the shower or anything, but, but I was with them. I was right there with them. I mean, what, yeah, is that why you smell so bad? That's terrible. Why are you bragging about that? And so, yeah, he's getting on them and, and kind of correcting them and trying to readjust their sight picture on how they should be thinking about their pastors, not as celebrities, but as slaves of Christ. Taking them off that pedestal. Take them off. Take them off. Um, and stewards, that word is a house manager. And so he's kind of talking to how God has tasked the elders to be managers of the mysteries of God and, and specifically to the household of God and for the family of God and for the people of God. So, yes, he's gifted them and equipped them to be an encouragement with that specific instruction, the mysteries of God. And remember definition of mystery is something that has been hidden until it's revealed by divine revelation which reminds me of the scriptures about how the angels long to look into the details of the gospel how they didn't even know until it was all revealed in the new testament and how it's all clear to us now and we see that and god has given to the church the bride of christ <coughs> preachers and teachers to steward those mysteries to teach the word to make it clear to encourage the saints to equip them to do what god has gifted and equipped them to do in the ministry uh, throughout the week it says that's how you should be looking at these fellows that you're mentioning their names specifically i'm reminded of second timothy 2:15 to the right, as Paul charges Timothy, who is a fellow elder, his apprentice, his son in the Lord. He tells him, do your best to present your, yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So, He's instructing his fellow elder at the time, hey, you are just a worker for God, and you are just going to answer to God, and you are just going to get your approval and acceptance from God, and the thing that you've been charged to do is to rightly handle the Word of God with the people of God, for the people of God, for the encouragement, for the building up of the saints of God. So just another context different audience, different thing, but you see the same principle at play at work there about the job of those that God has given for that particular task in the church. Now, why do you think, uh, what are some of the temptations that we face as people in this regard? I mean, is it even explainable that the Corinthians would be in this situation, ha having these thoughts and conversations, do you think yeah. it exists today? Yeah, it does. How so? What, what are you thinking? I'm thinking of like the mega churches. Yeah. And, you know the celebrity pastors, and I mean it, it's probably not. It may be on a little bit different scale, but it's probably not a lot different. I guarantee you, it's not a lot different. When you got this guy who's so good he's got to be piped across the country a private jet because God doesn't have a fellow who's capable of handling the word of God locally I think that's a great example personally um, and we can name some names and, and some of them you know well, most of them are, uh, you know, gifted, articulate, winsome speakers, uh, no doubt about it. And, and 
that's especially wonderful, you know, face to face. But the, there probably is something lost across the miles in the airwaves. And I'm probably the least of these, but I find it challenging just to keep track of a handful of people to try to minister and help and encourage and pray for. If you start getting into the thousands, oh, you, you left me a long time ago in terms of my capability to do that well. But yeah, I think it does still happen today. Um, Pete? I think a lot of this is, is coming from the old Judaism where the, 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 the so important they put themselves into a big pedestal that they kind of revert back to that a little bit. And are you saying who, who was important? Each individual? Each teacher? Each individual was self-important. Believed he was important. Yeah. Like the Pharisee that said, I'm so glad I wasn't a tax collector. Yeah, yeah. And so how is it that the Corinthians are making themselves feel important in this situation? Because they're, 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 they're lifting themselves up above, or they're lifting their leaders up above other leaders. That's right. It's the same principle. Yeah. yeah. So it's not even that they're really lifting the leaders up, so but they are, yeah. but they're lifting themselves up. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're like, I'm Tom Brady's best friend. I'm going to name drop this guy that everybody knows because these guys are great guys that they mentioned and they have been doing awesome things for God. And so they're just, they're getting the jersey. Yeah, man, I'm a Miami Dolphins fan. Of course, they're going to the Super Bowl this year. You're not? I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking nonsense right now. Remember, yeah, I mean, yeah, you are. When, we're, when I'm reading the scriptures, you're paying attention. When I get off track, it's probably nonsense. Um, so that's exactly right. They're, they're building themselves up by trying to associate with these other guys, which is why it makes such good sense, that last verse of chapter 3, when Paul's like, man, why are you going to hitch up to this guy's coattails. I mean, he's a great guy. I'm not saying that. He doesn't say anything derogatory about the, the people that are being mentioned. But he says, you've got Christ. Why would you settle for the water boy when you've got the star captain of the team? Because his, his bar is only here to look at, you know? Yeah. When you look at Christ's bar, it's yeah. so, you know, there yeah. might be a possibility of reaching this bar. Yeah. But, well, maybe. Yeah. I don't know, but he's certainly trading in a lot by doing that. Okay, so he's saying, he's, he's bringing them back to reality, because uh, Paul was awesome, remember? And so he's including himself in this group of preachers um, that God was miraculously using during this transitional time in the New Testament. Saying, this is how you ought to look at us. Instead of putting us up on a pedestal and making us out to be something that we're not superhuman or any different than you, really, because they're not any different, right? We're all the same this side of heaven. Yeah, God gives us different gifts, different opportunities, different strengths, different weaknesses, but we're all meshed together in one body, and we all need each other, so no one's any more valuable than the other. And so he says, uh, number two, he, he talks about the requirements of this group. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Um like that's the only requirement of these ministers is just to be trustworthy and faithful with what they've been given. He just got through talking about, you know, they've been given the mysteries of God to, to manage and, and work with the church and the saints. So it's God who is providing the word it's God who is providing the spirit, which we learned in chapter 2, is necessary to understand the word. It's God who's giving the gifts to each of us in the body of Christ to do our different parts, our different ways. It's God who's providing the power to change us and those we interact with. So, yeah, those, 
those names are associated with some pretty awesome stuff, but it all has to do with God. They're just the messenger. Like, I didn't, I didn't come up with these awesome words. They're not my words. You know, that's, I, when people on occasion get something out of a sermon I preach, it's a good sermon, I'm like, um, look, you can't help but do good when you got this kind of material to work with. You know what I'm saying? You, anybody could do it. It's not, there ain't nothing special about me. It's all special about God and what he's provided. It's just a requirement of these stewards, these household managers, that they be found faithful. Look, our only job, the only thing we need to bring to the table is faithfulness, which how does that differ from any other person in the congregation? It doesn't. We're, we're all called <laughs> to, be, to be faithful. Um, aren't the elders and the ministers, aren't they held to a higher standard? And they're judged to a higher level. Yeah. yeah. The scripture does speak about not let not many of you aspire to be teachers, knowing that you will incur a greater judgment. Yeah. So there is a little bit of respons- uh, judgment that comes along, responsibility that comes along with the office, w- which is all the more motivation for that individual to be faithful, and trustworthy, and to do that and only that which the Lord commands. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Verse 3. Any comments up to this? Other comments? You guys are doing good. Pitching in. Verse 3. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. And at first, you know, you can take that one two ways. My first way, I, when I ever, first time I ever read it, I thought, well, that's kind of proud and arrogant. <laughs> you know, I read it like, I don't care what you think. You think I care what you think? But but really, I don't think he's saying that at all. Uh, I think, you know, he's saying, look, I mean, he is a human this side of heaven. So just like you and I, we like to have friends. We like to get along. We like for people to like us, appreciate us, be kind to us, um, approve of our project, whether it's an awesome cabinetry work in the kitchen that you do or... Mechanical work, fixing a thousand kilowatt generator, or providing electric power, or fixing a broke company, whatever it is that God has gifted you to, to work at, you want people to approve of it and, and say you're doing a good job. But Paul's saying and recognizing, look, I, I'm not in this business of being a minister of the gospel of Christ to get a favorable judgment from you, nor are these other guys that you mentioned, Apollo, Cephas, or any of my fellow elders that have been tasked the same task, not not looking for your praise, not because, you know, we as people are so funny. I mean, the one, two, three, the six of us could listen to a fellow teacher preach, and we'd all six have a little bit different opinion on how he did, you know. Pete, would love him because Pete's the nicest guy in here, even though he looks the meanest. He's the nicest, and he'd say, "Man, you did a great job." Whereas me, I'm all grumpy and critical. I'm like, that guy, he missed every other point. Could have done twice as good. Had he, he probably didn't even prepare. You know, I'd have something for him on every every line. Um, and the point is, he shouldn't really care that much what Pete thinks or what I think as long as he's being faithful to God and faithfully handling the word of God to present the truth of God to the people of God for the glory of God and that's what Paul is saying to them in essence taking them down another notch saying your judgment although I hear you loud and clear you're being loud about it everybody knows about what you think about this preacher or that preacher but I'm here to tell you that your judgment really doesn't matter In fact, I'm not just getting on you personally because I don't like you or I have a low opinion of you because of the time I spent with you there in Corinth, but really any human court or any day in a human court, any any day where humans gather together to render judgment or opinion on a matter, he says "It's it's a small thing. I mean, yeah, I get it. It's part of our existence and everybody has one, but it's... is low. In fact, 
<laughs> and this is an argument to the extreme, right? In fact, I do not even judge myself, which again could be taken the wrong way at first. Like, you know, I don't even care what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> doing what I want to do and whatever. Uh, I don't think twice about it. But that's not it either because who is usually your harshest critic? Yourself. Yeah, yourself. You look in the mirror and you know, Seth and Peter, if you've got one hair out of place, you're like, oh, that stubborn hair is sticking up. It's not supposed to be over there. Where's the comb? Pour some water. Let's lay that thing down. Whereas I, I have no idea. Your hair looks always the same to me, Steve. <laughs> I don't know if you have bad hair days. I just don't know if you do or not. Maybe you do because you have hair. I don't know what bad hair days like. But, <laughs> again, <laughs> talking nonsense. I don't know what I'm talking about. The point is, you know. You're most familiar with yourself. You know, in general, how you did the job. Um, but Paul says, I don't even judge myself. Which is another, I think, consoling thing to the audience. Because it, just in case you got your feelings hurt when, when I told you, your opinion doesn't matter a whole lot. I want you to. I want you to know that. I, I mean, I think the same thing about my opinion. My opinion doesn't matter a whole lot either. Um, which, I think this got got me thinking. You were praying about something, Steve, and I was trying to pay attention, but I got sideways in my thoughts and got thinking about this verse, and I got to thinking about my heart. And what does the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah say about my heart? You guys remember that? It's working. Mm -hmm. And there's another, uh, must be an adverb because it ends in an L-Y word that, that comes before that wicked, I think. i got to look it up. That's Jeremiah. Inherently. Chapter 17. No, it's not L-Y. Well, there's an L-Y. <laughs> Depending on what version you got. Jeremiah 17, 9. Let me just read it. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I thought it was deceitfully wicked is in another translation maybe that I have in the back of my brain somewhere. Um, but it's it's deceitful. It's def desperately sick. And, and, you know, when you read about the heart in the Old Testament. It's not just the seat of the emotion, but it includes the mind and the will. And I love to listen to Albert Moeller talk about the noetic effects of the fall, N-O-E-T-I-C, um, which is to say that, you know, sin affected our brain's ability to think right, our logic, our induction, our deduction, all those things, such that especially when I'm thinking about myself, I'm so biased towards the good side. Like I have a blinder to, you know, most of my terrible, bad mistakes and shortcomings. And so when I judge myself, I'm like, oh, yeah. And in fact, that's another favorite thing I like to say when somebody wasn't there. Well, how did the sermon go on Sunday? I'm like, man, I think it went great. I, I love to listen to me. I agree with everything I said. You should ask somebody else who was there if you want a real opinion, though. <laughs> you know? Uh, so, yeah, let the scriptures inform how we think about ourselves. And, and, and you know what's the old saying, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Anything I think I should take with a grain of salt because I recognize that in my imperfection, this side of heaven, I don't do anything just right including making good sound judgments. <laughs> so who am I to be the one to stand up and say, yeah, I'm on Apollos' team because he's the man. You guys, if you're not with Apollos, you ain't nobody. And so I think that's part of the point that he's making here. Comments on that? Uh, now, that's not to say, and I think we've made it clear, but just to, to, to nail it home even further, I'm going to turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Because um, we're talking about judgment, and, and I want anybody to walk away thinking, well, we're not, what? not judging himself, don't care what I think. First Timothy 5, 19, 21, Paul is very clear that 
if there's sin, now we, we, that needs to be judged, right? Mm -hmm. First Timothy five nineteen. Do not admit a charge against an elder, except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Verse 20. As for those who persist in sin, who, those elders who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. So, um, yeah, we're all accountable, including the elders, including those up at the pulpit. You know, just because they have a different position and they get to talk a lot doesn't mean there's any different standard. In fact, like you said, Peter, maybe even higher standard because uh, of the effect that their testimony is having. So, yeah, we are to judge one another with regard to sin. But that's a unique thing about what we're talking about. Remember, we're, they're judging these elders, these preachers, in a good way. I mean, they're saying they're great, right? They're, they're, and their opinions are most likely very accurate. These men, again, have been doing great things for the glory of God, being very effective, very good managers, stewards, workers for Christ, rightly handling the word of truth. So they're doing a good thing. Paul's point is, as true as that may be, and remember that a lot of times our judgments aren't always completely true, you know, that's not the important thing. He goes into greater detail in verse 4. For I'm not aware of anything against myself. So his conscience is clean. You know, we always want to have a clean conscience. Having a short account of sin. You know, First John 1 John 1.9 reminds us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, you know, spiritual breathing you know, as soon as you realize that you've sinned, you should confess, repent, turn from it, agree with God that it's wrong, by His grace move on, hopefully never to do it again. And so we, again, we know ourselves better than anybody, and we do self-reflection and make sure there's nothing going on to our knowledge, uh, that we're disobedient to the Lord. So Paul's saying, I'm not aware of anything against myself. I, I think i got a clean slate. I think I'm doing the right thing. I think I'm being faithful. I think it's all good, kind of like you're saying, or at least those those of the Corinthians who are saying, I'm with Paul. He's my leader. He's my captain. I, I think you're right. I think I am doing the right thing and on the right track. But, he says, I'm not thereby acquitted. Just because you think I'm doing good, and I think I'm doing good, that doesn't mean I'm home free, that I've got everything right, that I'm doing it all good. Because both of us are capable of having faulty judgment this side of heaven. And then he gets to the ultimate point at the end of verse 4. It is the Lord who judges. Whose team are we on? The Lord's. Whose do we belong to? The Lord. Who are we working as unto? The Lord. Who gives us the paycheck? The Lord. Who's responsible for our salvation? The Lord. Who's our judge? The Lord. You, you get it, right? And that's his point to them, just like his point in verse 23 of chapter 3. You're Christ. You belong to Christ. Christ is the Lord. Christ is the judge for Paul, for Apollos, for Cephas, and for you. So, I read MacArthur. He had a good comment on this positive judging. So each of you men in this room are likable and you're gifted and you do things and you love the Lord. And I can only imagine, well, I, I can think of times when I've thanked you for what you've done and said you've done a good job and, and thanks and keep it up and you know we uh, we want it's a good thing to encourage one another and it's there's nothing wrong with uh, um, you know affirming someone and the question often comes up well how do I handle that because I know I'm supposed to be humble right and so I don't I, don't, I certainly don't want to say well, about time you noticed yeah I've been doing this a long time you just now seeing that 
I don't think that's the right response. I don't think the right response is, yeah, man, thanks, I ain't. You're right, I am pretty great. Was, that was a great one. Yeah, you got that spot on. Maybe we'll tell everybody else. Uh, I don't think that's the right response. And nor do I necessarily think it's the right response. Oh, no, nah, no, nah, that, was, that was terrible. That, that was nothing. Because then you're, you're kind of a, offending the person and really not telling the truth. Because, Pete, you did a great job in the kitchen a couple weeks ago. You're a skilled carpenter. The work you did was noticeable. It was wonderful. It was awesome. My wife's been happy ever since. Um, and so for me to tell Pete, man, you did a great job for him to say, ah, no, nah, no, nah, nah, that was not good enough. I'm like, oh, well, oh, I must be stupid. A, I don't have a good opinion. I, I can't see straight. My eyes must be crooked because I thought it was level. Pete saying, no, it's crooked. Um, you know, so that's not the right response either. So how do we respond? And, and, and MacArthur says, how about 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18? He says, and we all, each of us Christians, with unveiled face, comparing that to, remember when Moses beheld God, he had to have a veil over his face to conceal the glory that was fading off. Beholding the glory of the Lord. All of us Christians are beholding the glory of the Lord, fellowshipping with God Almighty, are being transformed into the same image. What image? The image of His Son. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 8, too. Remember, working all things together for your good, which is what? Being conformed to the image of His Son. Being sanctified, being made Christ-like. All of us Christians are being sanctified and, and being put into that mold of the Son of God. Back to the Scripture. From one degree of glory to another. So... We are progressing in Christ likeness. And that's what you are seeing in each other. And that's why you are encouraged by one another when you are using the giftedness that God has equipped you with to help the body of Christ. And so it's normal when you do your part in the body for those around you to be grateful, to be encouraged, to be thankful. And so when they express that to you, you, you can acknowledge that in this way and say, we're all being conformed into the image of our Lord, aren't we? Isn't he great? Isn't it great what he is doing in us and through us? And so you're not calling them a liar. You're not saying it's not real what they just experienced. You're just reminding them, yeah, I agree with you, but not I agree with you because I'm great. I agree with you because the Lord of glory is great. And that's who we're seeing. And I'm seeing it just like you. I mean, I can't believe I, would, I did that. that. That is kind of cool that the Lord did that through me. It was neat to be his instrument in that situation, to be able to have the right thing at the right time for the right person in the right circumstance. God is good. And so the point is we're just re reflecting or letting it glance off of us and go back to where it rightly belongs to the Lord of glory. That's what he's saying. And that's how, what he's reminding the Corinthians. Like, yeah, you, you're, you're, you're attaching to some awesome guys, but you're not to be the judge of that. I'm not to be the judge of that. The Lord is the judge of that. And the Lord is the giver of all those good things you're excited about with those people. And we just need to constantly be concerned about what does the Lord think? What has the Lord done? And let's give the Lord thanks in that. Does that make sense? Everybody tracking? Through verse 4. All right, verse 5. Therefore, anytime you see therefore, you ask yourself, what is the therefore there for? Therefore, in light of those things, the truths that we just discussed, do not pronounce judgment before the time. You've made a judge that, or some of you have made a judge that Paul is awesome. Some of you, Apollos is awesome, so I'm going to follow him. Others, Cephas. Don't pronounce judgment before the time. Who's the, great, who's the goat? Who's the greatest of all time? Back to verse 5. 
do not pronounce judgment before the time. What's when's the time? Before the Lord comes. Who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Now, again, keep in mind that we're talking about positive things. We're talking about positive people. We're talking about the servants of God, the ministers of the gospel. And Paul is saying the Lord is the only competent judge. And here's another reason why. Because he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness. Now, darkness in this context has nothing to do with evil. It just has to do with the heart. My brain, my thoughts that you don't know, can't hear or see or perceive. So you think you're making a judgment about me, but Paul would say, you don't have all of the information. You don't have all of the evidence to know. So why embarrass yourself and, and render your judgment like you're the expert like you know everything there is to know to make this decision in the court when you don't have all the evidence you'd be foolish to come to a solid final that's my final answer conclusion about the matter so it's not even safe to be doing what you're doing even though look I I think I'm doing right you think you're doing right I can't find any fault with me we're all in agreeing we're on the right track but but let's not do that let's not come to that conclusion before the time because we're not equipped to accomplish that job. Only the Lord is. And he'll disclose the purposes of the heart. And we just reminded ourselves about the heart, Jeremiah 17, 9. It's deceitful. It will trick you. It's desperately sick. So it's not healthy. So don't be leaning on it, trusting it, relying on it. And then each one will receive his commendation from God. Another confirmation that we're correctly interpreting here, this is all positive, these guys are going to receive commendation from God. You are going to receive commendation from God. You are going to get some kind of reward, some little, small, some large, great. There will be differing levels, but there will be con commendation from God, but he's going to be able to dole it out exactly right. You know, after the championship, after the season of whatever your sport, there's always heartache, grief, complaint, film to be reviewed and say, that referee didn't even call this. They would not be the champions had the referee made the right call. Period. That's easy. Everybody can see that. So, yeah, they're the champions, but they shouldn't be. And everybody's disgruntled with where the trophy went. But that's not going to be the case in heaven when the Lord comes and he settles all accounts, there'll be no fractional errors whatsoever, no accounting errors. Everything is going to tally up to the penny. It'll all be exactly just right. There'll be no arguments about it. Everybody will be in full agreement. Yep, he's the champion. And that'll be, of course, the Lord Jesus who gets that title, him and him alone. And so, again, his point is it's kind of futile to pick sides, to pick factions, to, to name your team this side of heaven because you don't even have all the information. You don't, you don't know what's going on. It doesn't make sense. The only team you need to be picking and associating with is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's whose team you need to be on. And you need to be hanging out with other servants, other slaves that have the same mindset. You, you probably don't want to be looking for a pastor, preacher, who thinks he's all that in a bag of chips and says you need to give about another million dollars for my private jet because I don't got the time to go commercial. You know, we need to fund this thing so I can get over there to California this afternoon, get me some red wine and some escargot because I'm kind of a big deal around here. You know, it's probably not the guy you're look, <laughs> looking to hitch up with, right? You're looking just for a guy who's just trying to be faithful, trying to be trustworthy with the, with the role that God's given him. Uh... <clears throat> Uh, just to remind us about, because we're talking about Christians here, we're talking about uh, preachers in this context, but all of us as believers, as we talk about the positive aspect of our standing with God and receiving com commendation from God was the word in verse 6. I remind you of Paul's words in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So all of you as believers will stand before God with no 
condemnation. There will be, that's all taken care of on the cross of Calvary, right? So, yeah, you feel bad because you could have done better, and all of us could have, could have done better by definition of who we are, whatever the topic is, whatever the situation, whatever the day was, whatever the job was. Yep, we could have done better. And we feel bad about that, and we want to do better, and that's okay, and we should try. But remember that there's no condemnation on you. Christ has taken your imperfection Amen. and handled it. So when God sees you, he sees the blood of Christ. You're right in God's sight. You're justified. Because he doesn't see you and your poor job and your out of plumb carpentry work. He sees the perfection of the Lamb of God, the blood of Christ. And so rejoice and be excited about that. And let, let those whispers of the enemy pass on by and know that, yeah, look, goodness, everybody knows I'm not perfect and can't do a great job at whatever I'm trying to do. That's old news. The good news is Jesus took care of all that. I, I'm, I don't have to deal with those consequences because he took them on my behalf. Uh-huh. Where that, are we? That's kind of trippy with Paul, though, because he was pretty much a mass murderer before he, um, before he arrived yes, he in was. Damascus, yeah. you know I mean? Yes, he so. was. <laughs> yes, he was. Oh, man. One other thing I wanted to touch in verse 5 was the Lord comes back and he will disclose the purposes of the heart. Purposes of the heart. What's another word for, for your purpose? The, I think, your motive. Motivation. And so I'm reminded, it'll be a few chapters later, chapter 10, he reminds us what our motivation should always be. Uh, you probably have this one memorized, 1 Corinthians 10.31. If not, you're going to recognize it when I start reading it. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That should be your motivation. Whether you're working on the Amen. generator, Amen. working on the cabinet, working at the toll booth, working on the power, working for some fancy company, you're just doing it for God's glory. You want to be a good worker that doesn't have to be ashamed when he stands before God and says, Look, I did the best I could with what I was given for your glory the right way. What's that mean? Well, you know, with integrity, being nice to people, considering others better than myself. All the things that the Scripture called me to do, just being a normal Christian, as I was going through life, I was just trying to do it that way, to your glory, so that the Word of God is not blasphemed uh, or spoken ill of. That's, our, that's to be our motivation in everything. I just want to please God. Why? Because He's the only opinion that matters. <laughs> right? I mean, hopefully we can help each other and steer each other and our... It's not that our opinions of each other are completely irrelevant or unimportant. I mean, they can be useful, beneficial. I want you to help me. Give me constructive criticism. Like, I could understand what you're saying a lot better if you would do X, Y, or Z. I, I need that. I want that. I, I want to do better. Uh, and, and we should help each other in love. But ultimately, you know, your job's not to make me happy or me accept you. My job's not to, to do that, but our job is to please the Lord. So, in that sense, it's ridiculous to try to have a competition to say who's the most honored servant among us. You know, I, I lasso up with Paul, I lasso up with Paul, I lasso up with Cephas. We all got, you know, strong opinions about which team we should be on and faction, but Paul's saying, it's kind of stupid. Why, why would you do that? It doesn't make sense for, for all these reasons. You're wasting your time. It's not profitable. It's not the right sight picture you should have. So stop doing it. Verse 6. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. Uh, I've applied all these things. What's that? All the analogies he's been using in these first four chapters. Remember, we've talked about farmers. We've talked about builders. We talked about servants, slaves. He said, well, he's constantly using those professions or, or workings to describe himself and the fellow elders that they're being factitious about, or factious about. And I, he says, I'm doing this for your benefit to kind of show you that, like when I use myself and I compare myself to a galley slave, I'm kind of telling you, I'm not the hero you're looking for. I'm not the guy to 
put on the pedestal that you're looking for. Jesus is the one that you're looking for. He's the one I'm pointing you to. I'm just trying to, to point you to him, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. What is written? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So there's an example of what's written. Yeah, you're to respect the officers of the church that God has, has put into place. It's just part of the church governance. Yeah, you should, you should do that. We're also, in, in, it's written that we should encourage one another. So that's, that's not a bad thing. But, he, but what is a bad thing? When you go beyond that and you're saying, you're the man. You're the point of focus. You're the reason for the success of this ministry. You've gone beyond. Because Jesus is the only reason why anything ever succeeds. And so you don't need to be encouraging a person, Paul, Apollo, Cephas. I mean, and you would be motivated to do so, right? Because the apostles especially, I mean, were God was using them to do super miraculous things, healing people. Crazy, not normal. You'd be tempted to say, you're the man. But you don't want to say that, right? Because you know, the truth is, no, you're not the man. Jesus is the Son of Man, and it's Him who's working through you, and to Him alone belongs the credit for that, those eyes now seeing that once were blind. You have to take Christ. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just hopefully, as each day goes on, a better reflection, a mirror image of, of Christ. And so, if you see anything good, trust me, it's not me. You're seeing it's Christ Amen. in me, Amen. the hope of glory. And so let's all be careful to thank Christ and to give Him the credit. So, Paul is saying that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. Why, why, would, you, why would you pour these accolades on a galley slave? That's why I'm using that analogy, to help you see the futility, the, the foolishness of doing that. That none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Which goes back to what you were saying earlier, Pete, how they were puffing each other up by being on the right team. And, of course, we see our kids do the same thing in, in, at the youngest of ages, you know, in school, hanging out with the cool kids. You know, I'm on their team. No, no, you can't sit at our table because you're not cool enough. We're all puffed up over here for some unsubstantiated reason. <laughs> we, we think we're better than you. Which, of course, it's not true, but we've got you believing it, and now you feel bad about it, and you're going home crying because you can't sit at our table, and it's all destructive not good and that's the consequences of sin and Paul's saying hey man don't do this because you know you're going to be on my team Paul's team you're going to be on Cephas' team and you're going to be at each other thinking one's better than the other because well they're not associated with us and if they had any sense boy they'd have this team jersey on but since they got the other team's jersey on it's clear to me they lack anything upstairs so Humility versus conceit or arrogance. Yes, it's okay to appreciate, respect, encourage, but don't don't ever exceed that. And you know when you do exceed that, you're not even doing it for the person that you're you're building up. You're doing it for yourself because you're like I'm on his team. And recognize it's it's. It's your own sin. It's your own heart and motives that need to be worked on. It's my own, you know, foolish to desire to associate and hitch up to anybody other than Christ. He's all in all. And so I think, you know, he's making this argument clearer and clearer to them as they listen. But, but man, verse 7, and we'll, we'll end in verse 7. Um, he gives them three questions just to really secure this board to the wall. For who sees anything different in you? <laughs> what what makes you so special? Uh-oh. I mean, you know? Uh, 
You can you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. What what makes who sees anything different? You think somebody sees something different in you than everybody else? No. I see somebody who after the sun's been down several hours, their eyes get droopy, they're sleepy, and all of a sudden, that big tough warrior earlier in the day, he's got to go sleep, just like the rest of them. Got to get, got, got to go night night. Get your blanket. Time to get some rest. What's the matter? Can't stay up all night. Bullying at those lobsters. I was yawning so much in that boat, out with four teenagers. And I'm trying to be tough, man. But I'm like, it's after midnight, guys. At least we're legal. But, man, I want to go sleep, you know. There's nothing. I'm, I'm trying to be tough, but there's no difference in me. I'm, I get just as sleepy as the next old guy after midnight. What's the second question? What do you have that you did not receive? That's just a great question. I think Nikki and I were talking about that tonight. I'm so incompetent. I can't even ensure I take another breath. Amen. I can't even ensure my heart beats another time. Much less, how am I going to, you know, take credit that God has gifted me with some sort of hand-eye coordination that I can fly 300 people around in a big old 515,000-pound uh, airplane? I guess I can't. If I can't take credit for the most simplest of things, I don't know how I could take credit for something that's slightly more complex than just the basics of living. And so anything I have has been given to me by God. I mean, I wasn't in charge of being born. God made that happen. Is that Psalm 139? He formed you and your innermost beings in your mother's womb. He knit you together. I wasn't in charge of that. I didn't get to do that. I can't take credit for that. Breath, heartbeat. He gave me a brain, connected a couple of synapses in there not all of them for sure but anything I have everything I have has been given if you have an education you had an instructor you know I think you have a good point I was thinking about this while we were talking there's kind of a fine line right you need to be humble you need to realize that you're nothing without mm -hmm. but at the same standpoint you know he wants you to thrive and he doesn't want, he wants you to not only recognize that he blessed you, but he wants you to enjoy, and he wants you to grow, and he wants you to live. So, you have to be humble, but you have to not denounce what he's given you, all wrapped up in one nice little package. Yeah, and, then, and that's, you know, getting those those steps in the right order is the, is the secret to success. So you can flourish be super fruitful, awesome, productive if you recognize that Christ is the Lord of all, the giver of life, and everything that you have and need. And when anything goes right or well or fruitful, you give him the credit. He's like, good. God is, is happy. As long as you recognize your place and give him all the glory, that's good. But the minute you start taking it on yourself, he has no part of that. He can't because he knows it's wrong and he can't have anything to do with wrong and he's going to put the kibosh on that deal. <laughs> and you're thankful for it because you want to be in line. You want to be walking in the spirit. So, yeah. Yeah, you got to get that balance right for sure. And recognizing that you're nothing on your own, but you, you do have everything in Christ. And that's what he said at the end of chapter 3 he said all things are yours you got everything his divine power has given us everything for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness the scripture says so you've got all you need to be all you can be but just make sure it's all for God's glory because he's the one that made you and gave you all that you have so the final question is, if then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? So if it was just a gift to you, why do you act like you generated it, you created it, you made it, you were responsible for its success, you were the reason for anything good associated with it? Why would you do that if 
<laughs> if somebody just gave it to you, somebody gave you a Ferrari, why are you going to walk around acting like you're the greatest automobile engineer, designer, production person on the planet? Somebody, you didn't build that thing. Somebody just gave it to you. Anybody can sit in it and push the gas pedal. So, yeah, it's kind of a good, kind of a good, clear message I'm receiving from the Apostle Paul about factions and divisions in the church. And Oh, my favorite preacher is John MacArthur. Oh, well, you ain't got no sense at all. If you had any sense, your favorite preacher would be John Piper. Or if you're Craig Campbell watching by TV, Steve Lawson. He's who he mentions the most often. <laughs> Uh, you know, we've all got our favorites, and that's fine and good. But, but look, all of our favorite needs to be the Lord Jesus. Amen. And hopefully we can get encouragement from one another. And, and I do relate more to certain guys than I do others. And that's normal, and that's okay, and that's a gift from God. But that's the important thing we remember, right? It's a gift from God. You're a gift from God. You're a gift from God. Those other men we mentioned are gifts from God to do God's work for God's glory. We're all in the same business. We're all the same workers doing a little bit different tasks, different ways, different times, different places, but all for the same God, for His glory alone. I think that's the message. So the message is don't be so silly, church in Corinth. Don't, don't be divided up, acting like there's different teams. There's only one team. There's only one captain. There's only one Lord. We're all in Him, and we all got all we need from Him. So live for Him. Get busy praising Him and repeating His name, His message. Just be faithful with that. Yeah, but when my pastor leaves, I'm going to go follow him to the church he's going to next, you know? Yeah. No. I know you're joking. <laughs> I don't know you that well, Nikki, but I know you're joking. <laughs> but boy, how many times has that happened? I think it has happened probably before. It's a human condition. It is. It's just, that's what we do. It's just not the last pastor we had. He's just not, you know. So nobody's going to end up being that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. It's not Jesus. Does that cover it? It's funny, though, when you do receive all these things and you get these things, what, what the overwhelming thing that I have more than anything is to give it away.